There is the carrier with new 4.1 gear or ring gear on it, new carrier bearings, the um, side gears and the spider gears are installed and I, I could actually slide that pin in there if I wanted to. Oh, another thing, while you've got your pins out, check them for wear. This one has a couple of marks from the axle shaft because this sits right in between the axle shafts here and here. You, can't, you can see them, but you can't feel them with your fingernail. You can't feel them at all. So just double check those and then you can double check and make sure you've got the um, spider gears lined up right there. Actually, you can actually, even if you wanted to, you could leave that in place while you assembled it so they wouldn't fall out if that made you more comfortable. Just maybe thread the uh, bolt in a couple of threads. But anyway, so there's, there's that. Now, um, there's my carriers. Okay, so... Next is I dug out my setup bearings. So here, if I can put, pull that off or not. I'm a, I'm a big proponent, proponent of setup bearings, so you're not pressing the actual bearings on and off multiple times. I started with the same 35 thousandth shim that uh, come off the original pinion. There's the inner bearing. Um, I started my notes started my notes I keep I usually try to keep copious notes of um, everything I'm working on especially like this so I can go back if needs be a, a year or so and if, if I get a call or a question or something I can look it up haven't really had to but if I could if I had to on on stuff like this plus I usually um, engrave around the ring gear when I'm all said and done and I'll show you I just usually engrave the date um, the preload, pinion preload, PPL, and then also the CPPL, which is, or the CPL, which is the com combined preload. And like, a, uh, I can't remember, I think it was on a forum, I, somebody had asked me. Um, I, had, I like to see, on, on these with new bearings, it's usually oh, anywhere from 15 to 25 um, inch pounds of rotating torque on the pinion with new bearings. Uh, used bearings, I'll go oh, 8 to 10, 8 to 12, somewhere in that range. Um, and then usually, be, so you make sure and get your carrier preload correct, you're going to increase probably another 6 to 8 inch pounds. So let's say, let's say I ended up with 20 inch pounds of rotating torque on the pinion. I'm going to know that p carrier is properly pro preloaded in there if I've got 26 to 28 inch pounds. So... Um, usually, like on the specs, I think, I think Spicer, Dana, um, I think Ford even on some of their service manuals, older service manuals used to say 10 thousandths of preload, but that's kind of hard to measure. So I usually take the original measurement, the original shims on the right and left side, I'll measure those and I'll try to st stay with that same overall thickness. If I'm working on one that somebody else has been into and I'm not quite sure, I will go solely off of carrier preload. So, um, okay, let's go underneath and put the, set the pinion in. Uh, I, I gotta double check because I'm hoping this uh, pinion bearing, outer pinion bearing will work with that new race. I'm pretty sure it will. It won't work the other way, but I'm pretty sure it'll work this way so that I can set the depth of this pinion and then, uh, oh, that was the other thing. Old, back in the old days, um, when I first started, a lot of times the aftermarket, Richmond in particular was one, I used a lot of them when we were racing and so forth, but Richmond in particular would set up, uh, would, would engrave, and what they would do is they, in the end of the pinion, they would engrave the dimension in which this, the ring and pinion, pinion were ground at off of center line. So that's where you'd set the end of this gear, the end of this pinion gear up was on center line. So it might say 2.583 or whatever, and that's where you'd set this off a of center line. And I've got a tool that has a couple of different size uh, aluminum sleeves that, that go into the carrier caps. 
and then it has a shaft that goes through it with a hole in the middle and you'd use that in the middle you'd you'd take that round shaft it was a one inch shaft you'd go in and you'd set off of that and you subtract half an inch because that's half the diameter of the shaft and that would be your center line so um back in the back in the 70s and 80s um the a lot of like general motors and ford and those guys would actually either put uh they usually put a little symbol on the bottom of the pinion like a triangle with a line over it or something and you would have to look at the factory service manual and see what the spec for that symbol was um, after marco would just engrave it nowadays they don't even do that this is just got a part number engraved in the end so and says it's uh cryogenically treated and a part number so um we'll we'll go solely off of contact patch and it and that's and that's totally acceptable and works really well um what you want to look for is a nice even pattern i'll, I'll show you when we get to that point but you're, you're going to just you're going to shoot for pinion depth first long before you ever start worrying about backlash you're going to make sure you get the pinion depth set in relation to where the contact patch is in relation to the pinion and the ring gear whether it's deep down in the valley or up towards the face that's where you're going to shoot to get your pinion depth once you get your pinion depth set then you move on and start focusing on backlash and usually when you get your backlash if the pinion depth is set correctly and you get your pinion and you get your backlash set correctly generally that's right where you're going to pull, follow fall in with a nice wear pattern so I'm going to stab this underneath there first and then we'll put the case spreader back on and set the carrier in and see where we're set. I've zoomed in a little bit on this. I've got the case spreader on. I've got the case spread apart. Um, on the, and when I took it apart, I put the, the dial test indicator over here and read it off the ring gear. Here I'm actually just putting it in the case and I've kind of measured how far it's spread apart. So. Now that that part's done, I'm going to remove my dial indicator and I'm going to insert the two spacers as I put the carrier in. So I'm going to, yeah, I think if I stand right here, I think you'll be able to see that. I'm going to go ahead and put the carrier in. Yeah, I'll go, go ahead and put the carrier in, put the bolts on, um, make sure I've got backlash before I tighten anything up. Then I'll back this off because you want to relax the case. And then I'll paint up a couple of teeth and we'll see where we're, where we're looking at. Um, the pinion. Move this drip pan so I don't trip over it. The pinion is in. So... Uh, I'll go grab the carrier. And whoops, should have put that shim in there first. There we go. Then go ahead and slide the carrier in. There's a little bit of clearance in there. Now, um, you need to make sure those those are fully seated. Um, I've got a, I bought a set of these a few years back there. Uh, I think they're made by A or B if memory memory serves. But you just want to make sure everything's fully. seated and there is backlash that's a good sign make sure my and there's no need to plug the coil or anything in yet because we're not to that point yet remember your marks So I've got one hash mark up here, one here, two up here on the side of the case, two here. So I'll go ahead and assemble that. The 
again, as you creep up on these, you want to make sure you have backlash. You don't want to ram that, uh, bind that carrier, that ring gear into the um, pinion. And I'm just going to lightly buzz that in there. It might be close on backlash, but we'll I'll have to run a wear pattern. That feels like probably in the, now, well, I don't even dare guess, but I'd probably say it's minor. Like, and what we're shooting for, I believe on this one is like seven to, seven to 12, I think is what they call for on this 8.8. .8. I like to go a little tighter than that. And this one's actually feeling really good. I would dare say this is probably to the five range, maybe even a little less than that. So. Let's, uh, let me grab a torque wrench, torque these in, and back the pressure off of the, the uh, case. Mm -hmm. Torque those down. lean torque wrenches around so I'll make sure put that back in its case and just for shits and grins here let's see where we're sitting yeah fat too um, okay so we know we have too much too little of backlash so we know we need to at least move the ring gear away from the pinion so before I do that I'm going to paint up a couple of spots and I'm going to roll it through and I want to see I want to check at least see where I'm at on my pinion depth where I got to pull the carrier out if I got to pull it out and move it I want to make sure and see where my pinion generally, depth is generally, at. Generally so, I will put a marking at least two sometimes three points around the ring gear but where I'm just trying to get a um, preliminary here on the uh, Pinion depth. I'm just gonna mark it up one spot in one spot so there. I'll take a rag and just kind of create some drag there on the uh, pinion and roll it through. And I'll usually go around a couple revolutions. On you want to go on the coast side and the drive side of the, the uh, tooth on the ring gear. And the way the, on the on the so on, on your gears here, you've got, it's a hypoid gear, so it's angle cut, so you're going to have an outside and an inside. The outside, so basically you have a tooth that's shaped uh, convexly, so on the outside, the convex side um, is going to be your drive side. Basically imagine it as, as the drive shaft's going around, it's trying to straight and it's trying to push that gear straight on uh, the coast side is the concave generally side. speaking that's why they go low pinion on the rear so you're driving on the strongest part of that tooth the dr the uh, the uh, drive side the convex side and then on the front that's why a high pinion front axle is so sought after is because you're actually driving on that same drive side of the ring gear you're exerting the force on the part of that ring gear that's pointing towards the pinion as it's approaching and the pinion is actually trying to straighten that out that's the strongest part of the tooth right there so um, you want to make sure you check both the drive and the coast side when you're checking a wear pattern Now. OK, 
Okay, let's see if we can take kind of a preliminary reading there. Coast side looks pretty decent. Actually, it might be running just a, a little deep. Dry side looking pretty good though. Okay, let me, I'm gonna zoom that camera in here and kind of show you what I'm looking okay, at. Okay, so we already determined that the um, uh, backlash is after the fact. We wanna work focus on pinion depth. Pinion depth is gonna be determined of where that contact rides down in the, in the, the valley or the face, the top, the bottom or the top of that tooth. So you've got your toe and your heel, and you wanna be fairly centered in there, but backlash will usually take care of centering it toe to heel. Pinion depth will take care of it from valley to peak. So that's actually, this, this one's actually a pretty good, see if this is a pretty good representation. Now you can see that doesn't come all the way up to the top, which is good. You'd rather have it run a little deep because you that's down, again, down in the bottom on the drive side is the most, is the strongest part. You don't want to be driving up here. That's why a case spreader is so critical when setting these up. Because if, if you don't have the proper preload on these carriers, it's going to allow that carrier to shift. And so as under high torque, high stress situations, which is where you need the strength the most, that pinion is actually trying to force that ring gear away from it. And if it can, it's going to ride up deeper, or excuse me, it's gonna ride up to the top, the weakest point, because it's the thinnest point of that gear. So if you do not have this set properly, and in my opinion, you just can't, you simply cannot do it without spreading that case putting that in there, releasing that case, and having your proper preload. You can, when you're talking 10 thousandths interference, you can't beat those shims in and, 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 and compensate for 10 thousandths um, interference. You're, you're, still, you're, you're still going to have some clearance. I, I, don't, I, I, I know the comments are probably gonna blow up over that, but um, I've been doing this a long time, and there's, just save yourself the expense of the gears, the, the time, everything else. Beg, borrow, steal. Well, not steal, but beg, borrow, buy a case spreader. Do it properly so that you can set that proper carrier preload. That way you can ensure that not only is it set up properly while you're setting them up, but a week, a year, a thousand, ten thousand, hundred thousand, that carrier is not going to continuously be trying to move. It, it already is... It by nature, you don't want to have any clearance in there that allows that carrier to move away from that pinion. Um, my gears on my Jeep were when I before I put my LS in, I had 92,000 on those gears, the 538s, and 538s is a low gear. That's a small pinion, and it's zinging going around there. Plus, probably another 35 to 40 thousand miles of flat towed. And when I pulled those gears out, they looked as, as pristine. The wear pattern, contact pattern, was, was just looked just as good as the day I assembled it. And it all was due to making sure I had proper preload and all the other dimensions your pinion depth, your backlash, everything. So, okay, enough off my down off my high horse about case spreaders. Um, now, now I've said enough, never mind. Um, here's the this one here is a good representation. Now you can see though that there's a definitive line down towards the bottom. So that tells me that that actually is, it's, it's not feathering out, that's a hard line in there. So I could probably actually run, this pinion is, in my opinion, might be just a little deep and it's getting down into the root of that and that, and that definitive line is cutting it off. So I may, that's got a 35 thousandths, I may try just a few thousandths less pinion depth and then reassemble it and see what our backlash looks like. Um, I, could, I could leave it and just move the carrier over and probably be okay, but I, I really would feel better about having just a little bit more clearance in the, down in the root of that gear. So I think I'm gonna try, I'm gonna see what I've got for shims. I might try to go to about maybe 30 or 32 thousandths shim and push that or let that pinion go out away a little bit 
and then I'll set it up with these same shims, and I think we're going to be pretty close. Um, if I can get a little bit shallower, I think we're going to be pretty close. If not, we will have to move the carrier away from the pinion a few thousandths to be able to get some backlash. But I think the uh, pinion depth is going to definitely help on the contact patch, and it's going to definitely help on the backlash. Like I said, we've got a fat two now. I think if we can move that out a few thousandths, we might be able to pick up a few more thousandths and be sitting, you know, five, six thousandths, which we still might be a little snug, but we'll check it and see. So I'm going to pull this back apart, clean this wear pattern off, pull the pinion, and see what I've got for shims. Pinion out, pinions out. Pull the setup bearing off. Original shim, which should be 35. Yep, 35 thousandths. Let's see what we got here. I think we got a 19. Yep, there's a 19. And I think we got a 10 or 11 here. I think it's 11. Yeah, 11 and a half. Yeah, 11, 11 and a half. I think we got a 10 here. Yeah, that's a 10 right in the money, so that would be 29. Let's do the 10, the 19 and 11. And that comes out, well, that's 30 right in the money. Yep, that's 30 right in the money, so let's shoot for that. Let's see where that lands us. It's like I said, it's not much. Okay, so let's go uh, back over to the truck and put the pinion in. You want to make sure that this coil is spaced properly. Yeah, I don't think I gained much in um, backlash. I think it's probably, I want to see where the pinions are running, but definitely going to be pulling this back out again to adjust some uh, carrier shims. Yeah, there's not much play, not much backlash there. So carrier's definitely gonna be coming out again. It's all right. Very seldom is this ever a one and done process. That little tube of marking compound was uh, from the last rear end I did here, probably a couple months ago. So I thought maybe, it's not quite a bit left in it, I thought maybe it would still work, but it was dry, starting to dry out. So let's uh, go ahead and I'll grab one of my other. Tubs here. Let's see where it. All right. And. Let's, again, let's drag. Check where we're sitting for pinion depth. If we're sitting good on pinion depth, I say we weren't. I don't think we was too far off. 
before. I probably could have left it, but it was just a little deep for my liking. So let's see where we're laying here. Yeah, that's riding much more on the drive side. Oh, and on the coast side. And on the coast side. Let me zoom the camera in here. So this looks this this was the right move. So you can see now we don't have that definitive break down in the valley. It's moved that wear pattern up ever so slightly. And it's much more favorable to being centered face to root face to root here, peak or peak to valley, whatever you want to call it. Much more favorable that way. It did move it slightly up towards the heel, but that could be backlash related. Remember, we're talking pinion depth first. So we want to get that positioned from peak to valley or face to root, whatever you want to call it. And it looks, that, that was the right move. So I like, I like that 30 thousandths much, much better. Even as we move around, yes, that's much better. Now, as we come to the coast side, see if that, that may not be showing up as good. Down here on the coast side as well, much more centered, top to bottom, face to uh, root to face much better so I like that 30,000 so I'm gonna leave that 30,000 so that seems to be the ticket there I'm guaranteeing I don't think I don't think we moved much at all if any on the backlash four and a half not quite five not quite five so so it changed it uh, nice wear pattern and moved it about maybe three Two and a half, two and a half, probably, probably two and a half. So we need to move that another, we, I'd like to get another two to three thousandths of backlash. So it's not going to be much. So that being said, let's go ahead, pull this ring gear out one more time. Well, hopefully, hopefully one more time. Hopefully only one more time. Let's go over to the bench and see what we've got to change some shims around a little bit. So again, I like to take notes. So on the first go round, I wrote down, up or not, I wrote down original shim pack, or pinion shim was 35 thousandths, it was slightly deep, so I went to 30 thousandths. I'm actually going to go ahead and put a little star on that one, like that. Now we had 273 on the left side and 270 on the right. So, for, so we need to move it to the left to get backlash. I'm actually just going to try to swap those two shims. That'll move it three, three thousandths, but keep our same overall thickness. So therefore our pinion, or excuse me, our carrier preload should be the same. So I'm going to move the left is going to be 270 and the right is going to be 273. Right. Give that a try. Oh, that's a pinch in the old uh, 
fingers in there. And uh, actually, before I paint that up, I'm going to check backlash and see if we gained anything by doing that or if I got to not even waste time painting it and go move some shims around again. Seven, right on the money. Okay, like that, let's paint her up. See what the uh, wear pattern looks like. This is actually thinning out nicely. I might just mix these two marking compounds a little bit here. It's working out really well. Now, when you're dragging this, you, you can also take a pry bar, put it down here, drag this, and run the, run the pinion gear around like so. I've seen, I've seen plenty of people do it that way as well. Um, I think I get a better, quicker, and a better uh, marking on it by driving the ring gear and creating drag on the pinion. But per personal choice, six one half a dozen of the other, it's not going to change the wear pattern because the wear pattern is the contact. So it's not gonna change the contact patch. Okay. All right, let's uh, grab the light. See what that looks like. Oh, that's a nice looking drive side. Very nice looking drive side. And a damn good looking coast side. I'm happy with that. Let me uh, grab the camera and move, it, move you in closer here. Here you can see the coast side is really nice as well. It's offset almost about the same as the uh, 
Um, the other on the drive side is to the heel. This side favors the toe just a little bit. Um, now I could probably get both of those centered back up if I moved out to like say 10 thousandths backlash, but I don't like going more backlash than necessary. Um, I'm, I'm comfortable with seven. Um, you can get up to around 10. I think the spec on this is six to 12 or seven to 12. Uh, things over time heat up and warm up and that clearance will go away. Um, so at seven, you're comfortable, never, not gonna run out of, of space. But if you start going to the high side, you can end up with a little bit of a clunk when you change front forward or drive to reverse. Um, I, just, I just don't like a lot of, a lot of backlash, a lot of, a lot of slop in the gears. I've always set them up a little bit favoring the snug side and that way they wear over time and there's bearings and everything else wear a little bit over time. You might pick up another thou, thou and a half. All right, so this is where I differentiate from a lot of people. I actually heat the bearings up and we're getting real close. Yep, getting real close. So I actually heat the bearings up to about 250-ish degrees for a couple minutes and then I slide it on. I don't like beating on these bearings if I don't have to, so this is just about ready to go on. I've got the um, inner pinion bearing pressed onto the pinion with the correct shims in. I didn't take those off. I just pulled my setup bearings off and pressed that new bearing on. Um, this is getting ready to go on. I have the seal all ready to go on. I've got the inside packed with grease. I'm just going to put a little bit of sealant around the outside. And then it should be ready to go on. And I've got my tools at the ready. I've got my grunt bar um, here. I did have to drill out my hole a little bit on the grunt bar so that it would fit the uh, hole pattern on the yoke. But that was, that was minor. That was very minor. All right, so heated bearing. This is where you kind of have to work fast. Slides right in, looks good. Now, actually it's a little too loose now. So at this point, I'm actually going to cool it just a little bit by putting a little bit of oil. Very little. And I want a little bit of oil in those bearings. I put oil in the inner bearing before I put it on, so we're good there. But I'm just going to put a little bit of oil in here. And we should have the slinger. Oh, there's a slinger. There's the slinger going on. Okay. That's not good. Okay. So now we can go ahead. I'm just gonna put just a little bit more oil. There we go. That should be good there. Okay, let's go ahead and put the seal in place. I've got a little bit of seal glide on it. Perfect. So that's driven in. And I've got a little bit of sill glide. I hope this is showing up. Got a little bit of sill glide around the yoke there. So we'll go ahead and put that on. Tap that yoke on a little bit. Now I'm actually going to draw it on with the old nut real quick, as far as I can. 
Then I'll switch over, put some Loctite on the new one, and we'll see if we can draw that in. Okay, we're getting close here. So um, there's no clip. Yeah, maybe a little bit since I took the nut off, but we were down to almost no clearance, or uh, yeah, no clearance, no slop in it. So we're gonna put some Loctite on that. Then we're going to take our new nut, put our new nut on it, and run that down. Now we'll put our grunt bar on. Grunt bar's on. Okay. Now this now we'll grab the big gun. This is my three-quarter drive. And I like this because it is extendable so that I can extend it out. These are new bearings. I think the spec is 15 to 15 to 30. I don't like that much. I usually try to go for around 20. Low 20s on uh, rotating torque uh, let's uh yeah, some tool tool cart here and just dropping crap everywhere yeah that's probably gonna be zero yep it's not even registering yet so we got a little bit more to go on the crust sleeve. The grunt bar back, the grunt tool back on. Okay, that's a little bit more. It's the bar's not falling too fast. Still not very much. You you want to creep up on these, otherwise you're pulling this all back apart and starting over. So you really want to creep up on this. Yeah, I don't think this is gonna be more than single single digits maybe. Yeah, three, three-ish. So we're getting close. Like I said, it's easier. You want to sneak up on it. You don't want to overshoot it because you can't really back these off this, um, with these crush sleeves. Uh, you want to creep up on them. Now, if it was a crush sleeve eliminator where it's just shim, you would set those up during the setup process. But they didn't have one for this application. So... Yeah, we might be getting close. I get to a tight spot there. Yeah, we're right at breakaway is about 40, but when it actually settles down, it's right at 25. We're going to leave it right there. Okay, now I'm going to 
drive this nut, this washer in, and then everything out here is done. We'll go back around to the, the uh, uh, rear of the differential. All right, before we take the carrier over, we are going to go ahead and drizzle a little oil in these carrier bearings inside and out so we don't get a dry start. Okay. Pinions lubed, carriers lubed now. Let's uh, go back over and stab this in and get it all torqued in place and then do one final check before we button things up. Get her up into place. showing up and the camera's on are going on the right side plugs out of the way I'll put that plug in and connect it as soon as I get the caps in place Okay, let's go ahead and back that off. Okay. And let's double check. Seven right on the money. I wonder if that'll show up. Move the camera over in the side of the. I want you guys to get the full experience that you're paying for here. Okay. Um, we'll go ahead and pull this little test indicator off now. Go ahead and pull my um, case spreader off and work on the plug here. Actually, you probably don't need to see me symbol this all the way back together. Um, 
I'll go as far as putting the axles and stuff back in. You probably don't need to see me put the brakes and stuff back together. All right, I went ahead and run one more pattern on it just to make sure. Hope this shows up on camera. You can see a really nice looking coast pattern there. And good looking drive side pattern. So we are good to go there and we go ahead and get this uh, case spreader. I hate taking these things on and off because I'm always afraid I'm gonna pinch my fingers in it. Probably because I have pinched my fingers in it a few times. Get the plug here. I'm gonna put a little bit of sill glide on that o-ring. Sill glide is all around that o-ring. Help it slide into the uh, hole a little better. So before I do that, I'm gonna go ahead and actually stick that through the hole. That it hurts. Hurt it snap on. I hope. I'm gonna make sure that engages, or you're gonna be back in. To the rear end again very soon when it's the first time you get stuck and you go to activate your locker you're gonna go why uh why is that not working a little six millimeter with the eight millimeter head on it too tight and break it but you want to be tight enough okay put the connect plug on and lock it lock the little red tab okay um that's all good that goes up on top um okay let's go ahead i got the spider gears in place and i can tell because the holes are lined up so let's slide the axle shafts in and when you do this you kind of want to support them a little bit I've actually lubed the seals like I sh uh, showed earlier so I'll slow slide those in and you want to push them all the way in put your c-clips in and then push them back out and we'll put the pin in okay axle shafts are going in now if you've been like me and you had the axle shafts standing up on the floor upright um, the oils drain down off the shafts and will pull down underneath by where the uh, reluctor the tone ring is and it can spool up there please go ahead and wipe that out because if not um, within a few miles that is going to start slinging oil out making you think that it has a um, leak when all in, when in fact all it is is the uh, um, in fact, all it is is the oil that was the residual that was in there is working its way out. So then you'll end up tearing it back apart for nothing, thinking you got a leak. So take a second and wipe that oil out of there. Okay. So put the C-clip in, push the axle shaft back out, and I'll clean this axle shaft as well, really quick. All right. This axle shaft cleaned out of the other end. Sliding into place. B 
There you go. Well, that one's in. And C-clip installed. Axle shaft pushed back. Okay. Now you're going to want to take your pin. Make sure you got the hole on the correct side. Oh, whoops. Went the wrong way for the pin. Okay. So go ahead and put that pin in. Line it up. Now I had to get a new pin or bolt there because the original one. Um, if I'm a ratchet here in my socket, the original one I could not get out. It ended up breaking a five sixteenths snap-on socket for crying out loud. So go ahead and run that in. And the, for the most part, this part's done. I will go ahead and put the cover on it. And the brakes back together. If possible, I like to let the RTV for the cover sit overnight so I won't be putting fluids in it. Um, I won't be putting fluids in it until probably tomorrow for the for I road test it and have the uh, owner come and pick it up. All right, so here's another thing that I do, and I don't know that anybody else does this. I have never run across seeing anything else like this, but um, beside the fact, I go ahead and do it. And what I do is engrave my specs onto the outside of the ring gear here along with the date um, when I had my business I would actually engrave my business name on it but um, now I just put an MZ on it and the date and then the pinion preload combined the pinion carrier preload and then the uh, backlash So I got the initials, date, 25-inch pound, pre uh, preload. Combined preload is 32-inch pound. And I had 7,000 backlash. Okay, like I said, I've never run across that before. I think kind of I'm unique in that respect, but whether I tear into this or somebody else tears into this, they have a good idea of where it was set up at. So they can see, okay, well, it's still set up there or it's, something's changed drastically, you know, look at bearings or whatever. So I don't know, like I said, probably a wasted step but I go ahead and do it anyway. So everything's done there. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and get the cover installed and then finish up the, out the axles. All right, so I got a bead of sealant. I've given the uh, case a uh, good wipe, wipe down. Put a couple of bolts through to to start. There we go. There was three of these that had studs. One was right there. Right 
there. And the one was right there. Yes, these had bolts and I've cleaned the uh, old sealant off the threads. So the uh, after the uh, six eight hundred mile break in period, we'll bring it back in and pull the cover back off, check everything over. And then it should be good for just regular service intervals after that. Again, I like to let this sealant sit overnight so I won't be putting any fluid in it till tomorrow and then uh, till the, ne or the next day and then I can go ahead and test drive it and have the customer or the owner come and pick it up. Okay, I do need to put a little bit of Teflon sealant on the magnet and put that together. Well, all right, I uh, just got back from the test drive and everything seems to be running good. So I'll uh, have the customer come and pick it up and put it through a few heat cycles. And then, I don't know, five, 800 miles, somewhere through there, we'll uh, get it back in here and pull the fluid, dump the fluid and check everything out. And, then after that, it's business as usual. So I appreciate you taking the time to watch. If you've made it all the way to the end, I really appreciate it. I'm sorry this was a long video. Uh, there was a lot of information to cover and I wanted to make sure I got as detailed as I could. So um, if you like the content, please give me a thumbs up. And if there's anything I can do better, please let me know that as well. And as always, I welcome the comments. So thank you very much. And uh, don't forget to like and subscribe.